The following program is made possible by the generous sponsorship of Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations, and by Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care for our community and our veterans from residential locations in Conway and Garden City. From the campus of Coastal Carolina University, the Center for Military and Veteran Studies is pleased to present Military Memoirs. Hello and welcome to Military Memoirs. I'm Rod Gregg and our guest today is Mr. Gene Rogers, a World War II veteran who was a radio operator in a B-24 bomber in the 8th Air Force in Europe and who also spent more than a year as a prisoner of war in Germany. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Rogers. Same here. Now, you told me earlier that you were uh, a student in high school, 1942. You decided you wanted to go to war. What motivated you to do that? The Army wanted air cadets. I took the exam. I was washed out because of, they told me I was colorblind. So I went downstairs, I was going home and I was disgruntled. I got to the next floor, saw a sergeant, and the big sign said, Uncle Sam needs you. So I decided, what the heck, I will may as well. I didn't want to be drafted, I didn't want to have uh, them put me in a cook school or something, so I decided I wanted to go fly. When I went in there, I asked the sergeant, what do you do here? He says, well, all you have to do is take this application, fill it out, take it home, and because you're under age, have your mother sign it and come back and we'll give you a position. You were enlisted in 1942. You uh, did your basic training, had no problem with that. No. Uh, you went to radio school and you were trained in South Dakota, Laredo, Texas, Salt Lake City. Then you found yourself being shipped to England where you were going to be a radio operator on a B-24 bomber in the famous, now famous, 8th Air Force. You flew 20 missions. Yes. Now, tell us about that first mission. What were your feelings the first time you took off and what happened? Scared. Scared as hell because, you know, you, when you get over there, we were attacked by uh, German fighters. And when they, you don't know what it's like, uh, whether you're coming back or not. But you say to yourself, let's get over this and let's see what it's like. When we got home, believe me, we kissed the good earth and we kissed each other because, oh, we got over that. The first mission you told me that you took, though, you had to turn around and come back. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? Well, that was a, a silly thing of, about the uh, nameplates on a Pratt & Whitney engine that uh, was on the, the, the four of them on a B-24. And uh, they were told to remove those Pratt & Whitney plates. Well, when they took the plate off, they didn't fill the holes that were drilled into the uh, main body. So the oil came out of the, uh, was sucked out of the uh, engine. And it was reported by our ball gunner that there was uh, something happening to the uh, engine, that there was oil leaking out of it. Well, when they got back to the uh, base, the crew chiefs found out that it was coming out of these four holes. So some worker at the plant took the nameplate off this engine, left these four little holes, holes. where it had been fastened in, forgot to fill them fill in. Them in. That caused the engine to leak oil. He had to abort your mission and, right. and go we, back. We aborted the mission. Now but you, we got credit for it because we crossed the English Channel. But then not at, long after that, you started going on missions such as the one that uh, to Goshen, Germany. 
and you were at, uh, your target was an aircraft plant there, and you ended up getting a citation yes. for it. But that was a tough mission, a lot of fire, but uh, you accomplished that mission. mission. Can you talk about that one to Goshen? Flying to it, we were at, uh, in any aircraft was unbelievable. Uh, we got hit a couple of times close where when we got down to the, got back home, they examined the plane. They found shrapnel here and there, all different parts. In fact, one of the number three engine had a big chunk of shrapnel in it from a uh, burst from the shrapnel from the uh, anti-aircraft. But when we got home, it was, when we got there, it was about half cloud cover. And we could see the airfield, but there was a lot of airplanes parked in the, on the airfield. And we bombed it. And we got back, and oh, there was a big hoopla. There was all oh, the generals and everybody came. We were wondering what happened, why it was a big to do. We found out we had wiped out the entire air, airport, the entire factory, everything in Gosha. Goshen was wiped out, and this was something that they had been trying for a long time to get to because of either the Germans had put a smoke screen over it or the cloud covered it over it. But we just happened to be at the right time in the right place, and we could just see the airplanes on the field. We could see part of the factory and then the clouds. But in the meantime, all the bombardiers had already spotted it. Well, this was a severe blow to the Nazi oh, Air Force, it, it to wiped, the Luftwaffe. It wiped, wiped them out <laughs> in that Goshen completely, and that's why we got the citation. Everybody uh, coming down, they thought that was the greatest thing that they, they saw. Did you lose anybody? Not in our plane. Right. But in the in the group, I don't remember how but many. But you did, you, lose, you did lose people. You oh, knew. yes. What's it like when you lose somebody like that? World War II. Uh, you forget it. You got to forget it. You can't keep it. Because like I say, I, I have that picture of our crew. I keep that because I still remember those guys. You also flew into Kiel, Denmark, where the, it was reported that uh, the Nazis were trying to make later it was Hard determined water. trying to make heavy water heavy. right so for an atomic bomb that yes. they would drop on London or right. American forces or whatever and the the Nazi uh, atomic bomb program was really destroyed and it was destroyed in no small measure partly by raids on places like this one that what can you tell us about that target yes. and that raid well we were told that it was a uh, part of Kiel and there was a big factory that they were trying to bomb. And we didn't, they didn't tell us what it was for or anything like that, but the, we were supposed to bomb Kiel and bomb the locks. Well, in Kiel and part of northern Amsterdam is below water level. We found out when we got back, well, we got back, it was 50 degrees below zero because this was winter time. But when we got back, they told us that half of Kiel was underwater because we had hit all the locks and the ocean came in and flooded all of Kiel. So that was another semi-citation that we got because we, we uh, destroyed Keel. Well, you use this uh, skip bombing technique to bomb the dams right. to destroy the production of the heavy water. Heavy water. Who knows how many lives you saved by well, doing that? But what was that skip bombing technique? <laughs> how did that work? Well, it was you. You line up the the water. You line up the uh, the river, and you go. And then the bombardier he takes over two minutes, two minutes before. Uh, bombs away, they have the initial point, IP. When you get to the IP, the plane is taken over by the navigator bombardier. And he gets his sighting, and when it reaches IP, the bombs automatically go. And then you take off. You don't know what you did. 
But later on, you find out, boy, we really knocked the hell out of Kiel and the bombs and the lock. I mean, the locks and everything. So it destroyed all of what they were doing in there. We didn't know it, but we did it. Well, a lot of missions, 20. And on your 20th mission, you would uh, encounter something you hadn't encountered before. It would prove to be the, your deadliest, costliest mission. You'd lose a lot of your crew, and you would wind up in a German prison camp for more than a year. We're going to talk about that when we return. They're all around us. They're the men and women who served in our nation's armed forces. In good times and bad, they've been willing to stand in harm's way to preserve, protect, and defend the legacy of freedom we enjoy as Americans. All of them gave some, and some of them gave all. We owe them a lot. So the next time you see an American veteran, say thank you for all of us. And welcome back to Military Memoirs. I'm Rod Gregg, and our guest today is Gene Rogers, who was a uh, radio operator on a B-24 bomber in the U.S. Air Force, 8th Air Force, in World War II in Europe. Now, you told me you flew 20 missions, and um, it really kind of uh, some of the most difficult missions you could really imagine, kind of a, uh, holding on by the the edge of your fingernails yes. to get through some of those, but the 20th mission, 20th mission took you into a place where the Germans had submarine production facilities. It was on the border of Germany and Switzerland near Lake Constance at um, a place in Germany called Ludekoven. Ludekoven, yes. Now this was, this ended up being one of the worst missions anybody could have flown. So. Tell us what happened uh, and how you ended up going to that particular target. Well, we had gone to Frederickhaven, which was on the very northern end of Lake Constance. And that was where the basic uh, machining was done on these submarines. And then the parts were shipped to Frederickhaven. And there they uh, reassembled the submarines and tested them in the lake. On our per uh, previous mission, when we went to uh, Frederick, uh, Frederickshaven, we had practically wiped it out. So we had to go back to Ludwigshaven to do the rest of the bombing to completely wipe out the submarine building and the manufacturing there. So that's what brought us all the way down to Lake Constance. But you really, on this 20th mission, were not supposed to be going there. You are supposed to be going somewhere else, you thought. Well, we were, the, when, in the morning, our briefing is done by the, an officer, and he tells us where we're going, what we're carrying, and so forth, and how long the mission is. He got through telling us that we're going to go to Strasbourg in Germany and then fly directly to Munich. But when we get 50 miles from Munich, we were to make a 180-degree turn and come back to Ludwigshaven. Instead, when we got to Munich, we made a 90 and went down south. Well, everybody that was flying on that mission, the pilots, had their intercom, they were talking to one another and asking, what are we doing going south? We're going to fly over Switzerland. The next thing, we, the lead plane made another 90 degree right turn, and lo and behold, there we were directly over Lake Constance. Now we thought, everybody thought, pilot, everybody, what are we doing? The, briefing officer told us, definitely stay away from Lake Constance. Here we are going, heading into Lake Constance. And they told you to stay away because it was so heavily defended. They, they said that Lake Constance, because of the submarine manufacturing business there, that the lake was completely lined with flak barges. And these people were deadly with their guns. So... 
when the plane, the lead plane made a turn to go right and we saw Lake Constance, we were utterly confused. That is the pilots and I and radio and everybody. And well, as a radio, let me interrupt you a moment, please. As a radio operator, you could hear this chatter going. From, what, right. What were the other pilots saying in this group? They were all saying the same thing. What the hell are we doing here? We're not supposed to be on Lake Constance. We're supposed to be away from it. We're supposed to be 150 miles uh, north of here. Well. And how many planes in your group? There was well, the whole group, 49 bombers. All following. 49 this following. Now, we were leading the high element. They had three elements. There was the, the low element, the lead element, and then the high element. We led the high element. And we could look down and see the lead plane going into Lake Constance. And we said, what the hell is he doing there? Well, lo and behold, we saw him explode. Mm. He went to pieces. And the planes alongside of them, this one went down, that one went down. They scattered. The whole group scattered. When we left, well, we took off heading north to get away from Lake Constance. When we got together, the pilot, our pilot, got on the interplane communication and had all what was left try to rendezvous on us. We were heading back home. That's because you were... Experience. Experience. Had we had missions. 20 missions already. We were leading, so and the planes were all over, scattered all over the sky. When they got over past Lake Constance and over Germany, we counted the planes. There was only 17 left. 17 bombers out of 49. So somebody made a mistake, or or there was some type of intentional. Uh, deception made to try to throw the Germans off, but whatever well, happened, it was a disaster. What I said, I was started when I came home, I said, I keep telling people like you about our mission, that, and I keep saying to myself, either it was sabotage or it was a big mistake on the, on the American part, what whatever. Happened, what happened to the remaining aircraft? Well. We started to get rendezvous together to form a mission, but they were still scattered. And lo and behold, and right in front of us, a whole flight of German aircraft. There was uh, ME, uh, ME 210 and the FW 190s. And, what, and well, the waste gunner called in and said, there's a whole flight of planes on our right. Uh, the pilot said, well, we're supposed to meet our rendezvous, our escort, rather, at the rendezvous point over Strasbourg. Keep an eye on them, because now we're heading back to Strasbourg. Well, all of a sudden, the waste gunner yells out, bandits, 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 and all the whole group started to turn and head towards us. Well, the first thing that we had was a man on our right. We knew that he was flying. Well, I called and told the pilot that we had a, a, a plane on our right. And I told him that uh, he's with us, and he waved. Well, when the two tents turned around and faced us, they said, if you see the traces from the gun, they're not yours, because you could see the trail go over the bullets. But if you don't see them, but you see the flash, you know they're yours. And sure enough, that's what it was, that the first row of three that came in, they came in and we could see their traces of the 30 caliber. And then we saw the traces of the 20 millimeter. And we watched this guy and sure enough, he blew the pieces within maybe a minute or so. They had hit him. The next thing they moved over, we could see the, tra now we could see the next row of three coming, but we couldn't see traces. We couldn't see anything. We said, this is it. So those were the German air fighter aircraft and they tore up the remaining planes. What happened in your plane? Well, from the tail, now I, 
from the tail, I went back, because I'm radio operator, I don't have any gun position. I'm available to go around and see uh, how things are yet. So I took a bottle of oxygen, hooked up my mask, and walked to the back to see how everybody was. Well, as, as he said, as we were pulling out, I walked back and everybody was fine. I walked back to the flight deck and I told the, I was going to tell the uh, pilot what had happened, how everything was. I could feel the shudder, shudder, shudder. I said, they got it. I feel the shudder. What it was was 20 millimeters blowing up from the tail. The guy, whoever was in that 109 had us lined up. He had five 20 millimeters come up. The next thing, I grabbed my helmet and my flak suit. Well, I had a flak suit I used to sit on. I grabbed my flak suit and I held it up. I held my hand, pulled myself down like that, and the next thing, a 20 millimeter blew up over my head. The burst hit the top turret plexiglass dome and knocked it off. The burst knocked the gun because our top engineer had his guns facing mm -hmm. straight ahead so the guns were out. The burst hit the side of the gun, knocked it off the, the rack, and it knocked him, knocked him out, broke his jaw, and knocked some teeth out. How many crew members did, did you lose? Well, at the time, when I, when I left, we were all, all all right. By that time, when I came back and I tapped the engineer, uh, the co-pilot on the shoulder, and I was going to tell him what had happened, and I hear these bursts coming up, I said, there's something radically wrong. Well, by that time, the pilot pulled the yoke back and forth and turn and turn like that. That plane just went straight ahead, and I said, oh, the pilot yelled on the intercom, let's get the hell out of here. It's all gone. I jumped down, opened the Bombay doors. They, the pilot and the engineer grabbed the co-pilot, who was all bloody, picked them up, and held, the, held his ripcord and threw him out the Bombay doors. Well, when I got out of the uh, nose section where the handle for the Bombay doors was, the pilot engineer had gone, so I was left in there all by myself. And the funniest thing was, I didn't have my oxygen mask on. I didn't have my oxygen belt. So I was starting to feel, everything was feeling rosy daisy. And when I got down, I sat down on the catwalk. You would never get me to sit on that catwalk. It was only that wide. The Bombay doors are open. I sat on that edge, and I looked down, and I said, oh, now I didn't have my shoot on. <laughs> so I had to, I said, where the hell did I leave my shoot? Oh, my radio room. So now I had to get up, go back up, and get my shoot. Now I come down, I got my shoot in my hand. We were at 33,000 feet, and everybody's gone. And I'm sitting there all by myself, and I'm thinking, oh, this is great. Now I took my chute, and I figured, how the hell are I, what, how does this thing work? Because now, I, well, I finally hooked it on, and I leaned forward to find out where the ripcord was. And the next thing I know, I'm laying and I'm looking up, the clouds are way up above me. And I'm falling down on my back and I'm wondering, what, where am I? What is this? And I looked down and I could see the ground, the trees. And I said, oh, now I'm, where the hell is that ripcord? I grabbed the hole of the ripcord and I popped it. Now I find out. The dirty tricks of the German. When I'm coming down in my chute and I'm looking down to see where I'm going to land, this ME-109 comes down at me like that. And I thought, oh boy, he's going to... Fighter aircraft. Fighter aircraft. He's going to shoot me. No. He comes down and he goes up straight. So the prop wash 
collapses the chute, mm -hmm. and down goes the chute. They say the, the chute candlestick, and the crewman went down. He gets killed. They say his chute never opened. Well, because right. this German... And what happened to you? Well, when I come down, I found myself laying on the ground, and lo and behold, I, well, I steered my chute with the shrouds because there was a nice field below me. I steered the chute, and the next thing I wound up, the chute was covering me, and I looked around, and I noticed that I was laying alongside of a tree stump. When I came down, I must have hit that tree stump, which I did with my left foot. I broke the knee, the kneecap, and I had to lay there. And, and of all things, a German come over to me who was working as a uh, German forester. He was uh, conscripted into the German army. And he circled me with his little axe. And he says, he comes around in front of me, and he says, oh, And I says, no, 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 did I have a gun? Right. So I <clears> took <throat> off my harness, sat there. He helped me up. Well, he helped me up because when I stood up, I wanted to take a step, and my knee buckled, and I went down. So he helped me up again. And the funniest thing was that uh, I, well, I finally told him, I turned around and I walked backwards. And I dragged the leg rather than try to lift it forward. So you were captured by this, this German. Your aircraft uh, crashed. And you have mm. some sketches you made of this. From what, from what we know, the, air, the airplane went into a slow falling leap form, leap form and it landed almost 50 feet away from us. And you, um, four of your 10 member crew survived. The other right. six were the, lost. You yes. Know, killed by the fire or in the crash right. or one of the others. Now, you spent 13 months in a German prison camp, Stalag Luft 17D. D. And the German commander you told us earlier had been a prisoner of war in World War I oh. and treated well by the Americans. Oh, oh yeah. So how were you treated for that time? Well, one thing I was very surprised of was I got a parcel from my mother. We were getting parcels from the United States. At the same time, we were getting a Red Cross parcel. Every, every person in that camp, there was 4,000 uh, Americans, every one of us got a parcel. In that parcel was cans of food, sugar, coffee, cigarettes. Every parcel had seven packs of cigarettes, seven times 4,000 guys. You know how many cigarettes that is? <laughs> we, we finally got to the Swiss delegate and we asked him, could we make up a care package and send it back to the United States? full of cigarettes. <laughs> well, the bottom line is that you wound up in a prison camp that was run by a captain, the German Gun. commander, who had uh, been treated well, well as a prisoner of yes. war in the First World War, and as a consequence, you were treated fairly well, fairly you well. said, compared to that. Yes. Uh, but you were still a prisoner of war for 13 months until you were yes. re patriated because of your injury. Right. Well, uh, so you came back you home and you left the military. You worked uh, as a plant manager for much of uh, many years in the aircraft industry, retired to Myrtle Beach in the 1980s. And uh, we could do two or three programs and talk about your experiences, but we want to thank you for your service. It was an honor to have you here. And yes. uh, we thank you so much for spending time with us. I certainly appreciate it too. Thank we you. Thank you, sir. It was an honor to have you here. And we thank you, too, for joining us for Military Memoirs. The preceding program was brought to you through the generous support of Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care from residential locations in Conway and Garden City. And by Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations.